The world of retro and vintage electronics would not be what it is today without a few of the well-known Japanese companies that led the way in the 80s and 90s. One of those companies, Toshiba, was officially founded in 1939 as Tokyo Shibura Denki, also known as Tokyo Shibura Electric, and renamed Toshiba in 1950. However, it was not known as the Toshiba Corporation until 1978. In the last 70 years, Toshiba has been at the forefront of technology bringing us many different devices over the years, such as the TAC digital computer from 1954, the first Japanese word processor in 1979, the transistor television, HD DVD, and so many more. And like many other Japanese manufacturers of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, they manufactured different high-quality robust audio equipment like radios, tape decks, turntables, and of course amplifiers. Amongst those were what we called quadraphonic amps. Today, quadraphonic amps are referred to as 4.0 surround sound. Quadraphonic sound uses four speakers positioned at the four corners of a room that are independent from each other. This was used to recreate a three-dimensional live concert hall experience and was the earliest consumer product in surround sound. The technology was developed sometime in the early 1950s by Telefunken and machines first appeared in the European music studios by 1954. Early attempts to reproduce this for the home market began in the late 1960s. In 1967, the group Pink Floyd debuted its custom-made quadraphonic speaker system and performed the first ever surround sound rock concert controlled by a device they had made called the Azimuth Coordinator. The device used dual joysticks and allowed the musicians to place sounds in any speaker and move them around the room. The audio mixing process for four-channel sound is different than for stereo versions of the same recording. Most studio equipment was designed for stereo only, so specialized multi-channel mixing consoles and playback systems had to be available. Today, all the multi-channel audio systems in common use are digital systems. While surround sound is a popular thing today, unfortunately quadraphonic sound was a commercial failure due to the variety of technical issues, formatting compatibilities, the more expensive cost to produce them than the two-channel stereo, and the extra cost of two additional speakers required. Furthermore, in the 1970s, the most popular medium used to market recordings to the public was the vinyl LP, and quadraphonic audio reproduction on vinyl phonograph records was problematic. However, quadraphonic recordings on 8-track tape were also popular in the 70s, particularly among car audio enthusiasts. And while a lot more can be said about the format, you can see why quadraphonic sound is an important part of our history that paved the way to our music listening and home cinema experiences. I recently acquired a piece of that history with a donation of a Toshiba quadraphonic amplifier from 1973 that's in need of some attention. So let's go ahead and give it a well-deserved new life. Hello everyone and welcome. I'm the Retro Repair Guy. While <laughs> reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated, um, I took a week off in July and on top of that this amp I think got the best of me. Wow, there were so many components to change, okay? Um, now, I ran a poll and I was supposed to, uh, you know, do the tape deck. And I know I kind of like looked at it and said, no, no, I'm going to do the, the amp. It'll be easier because I, I thought when I did my uncle's amp, it was 1977. And I figured there's a lot of space. It'll be easy. It'll be quick. Get that out of the way and then I'll jump on the tape deck. But boy, did I pay for it. Now, I think one of the reasons is because it's a quadraphonic amp. And what happens is everything is doubled up and, and there's boards for everything. There's a, bun, uh, you know, a board for the front channel, a board for the rear channel, uh, and then there's left and right on this, left and right on that. And, and there's a lot of other boards, uh, one for, they call it sound quality, one for, uh, you know, uh, what was it? Anyways, I forget, but there's so many uh, boards and so many components and everything's crammed into this little box and there's wires everywhere, right? Because, like you know, unlike today where everything is on one board or, or chips that are doing everything, ICs are doing everything, um, everything is separated. So I think I changed 68 capacitors in there, okay? Um, and it, it was really, really insane. I'll, I'll give you the exact count later, but wow, uh, it was so many of them. So I was freaking out. And that's why the show is a little bit longer today. Uh, aside from that, I've been preparing also shows for August. And believe it or not, Halloween's around the corner, uh, especially when you're planning shows and everything. Now, a lot of you have been writing to me and also commenting, you know, please do this, please do that. Uh, please fix more typewriters. Please fix more of this. Now, the thing is, is that I really want to diversify my content here. And so, you know, I want to figure as long as it's 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever, even 50s, if we have old stuff, I'll fix it. 
uh, but the thing is I don't want to you know necessarily do a computer every show or uh, a TV or amps all the time I want to you know like I said bring you as much as you know different content as I can so um, if you are however because I you know I did computers before uh, and, and people are asking me more for Commodores and stuff there's a lot of other channels that do only certain things uh, and one of them by the way really nice guy I met online we've been exchanging a few emails uh, his name is Peter and he has the the show called 8 bits in the basement um, now he repairs computers there's a lot of repairs on that all the old computers so if you want to check his channel out I'm shouting out to him um, 8 bits in the basement really really good little channel there and I, I you know he's growing like me and I think really um, I, it'd be nice if we could collaborate one day and do some work but he's in France I'm in Canada so we'll see we'll see how that works out but uh, yeah so that's it uh, that's all I want to tell you for today and we're just gonna jump right in and see what we can do with this quadraphonic amp this video is sponsored by PCBWay, an exceptional manufacturer of printed circuit boards of all types. They make top quality PCBs from your Gerber files starting at only $5. Whether you're in need of getting your own PCBs manufactured with reasonable prices for production runs or simply a one-off prototype PCB, they offer excellent quality and unsurpassed service to help you with your designs and free online quotes. With quick turnaround times and fast delivery, I definitely recommend checking them out. The link is in the description below. I received this unit as a donation and it was in rough looking shape and very dirty. I was afraid to even plug it in and make things worse, but I did anyway. I forgot the cable in the mic input of the camera so this part of the video sadly did not record audio, but I wanted to show you that the unit turned on. The problem was that I could only hear sound coming out of the front left speaker. The front right channel, as well as both the left and right rear channels, had no sound at all. Furthermore, even when set to tape, you could hear the white noise from the radio come through and when I shut off the unit you could still hear the sound for a few seconds until it died out as if you had turned off a walkie talkie. So I just went ahead and opened it up. As usual, I began with a simple visual inspection of the board to check for any obvious damage, such as burnt capacitors, resistors, or previous repairs. To inspect the other side of the board and access the components, I needed to remove the large heatsink. After 50 years, the mica insulators needed to be changed as they are dried out and there's barely any compound left. When I tried to pick it off the table, it broke apart between my fingers. One of the channels had a burnt fuse, the two boards are identical, and on the other board, both fuses were burnt. 
clearly why I was getting sound only from one speaker in the front and no sound from the back. But the question was, why were three fuses burned? The fuses are directly connected to the collector of the transistor, which led me to believe the transistors were shorted out, something I was really hoping had not happened. I tested the transistors and was getting some word readings. I knew I would probably have to remove them from the board in order to test them properly. I ordered a bunch of parts and the four large axial 1000 microfarad capacitors that were mounted on both boards. As usual, I received them quickly and I'm very happy about that. I removed the fuses and began desoldering the large 1000 microfarad capacitors. They were glued to the board, so I had to gently pry them off. I then gently scraped the glue residue and cleaned the surface with 99% alcohol and a toothbrush. Testing these large capacitors showed they were off spec as they tested a 1240 and 1260 microfarad, one having 8.8 ohms of resistance and the other 23 ohms. They clearly had surpassed their lifetime. This also gave me a little more space to test the diodes on the board which tested fine. And then I just rinsed and repeated on the other side. For the new axial capacitors, I was unable to find audio capacitors, but I found these extended life capacitors made by Eleanor Capacitor, rated for higher voltage and 105 degrees. They also take up a little less space on the board. And of course, in the middle of it all, my desoldering pump broke and I had to get a new one. My third this year. I continued to remove the four 220 microfarad capacitors on the front channel board. The story here was the same and even worse. The 220 microfarad was testing at almost 300 with 84 ohms of resistance. After working on the board up close and removing a few capacitors, I found that both sides of the board were pretty dirty. So I went ahead and dismantled the other board and figured it was time for the good old dishwasher before I continued working. And because I love the comments, of course. So when you're fixing uh, an old amp like this or any other amp, especially when it's old though, um, the transistors have little micas in the back that uh, isolate them from the uh, heatsink. Okay. So the thing is, is that these were, you know, they're plastic. They were dried up, the plastic crumbled, fell in, in, in my hands, and uh, there was a little bit of uh, thermal paste in the back, and that was also dried up. Now, I bought these new silicone uh, pads, okay, isolators, for the transistors. And again, you, you know, see them on the, as a close-up, uh, but they are silicone. Now, it, there's a debate, there's a lot of people who say, do you need thermal paste with it, do you not need? Uh, I put it, I put it on the back of it anyways. Uh, I find it helps even more. So having that, because one's an isolator and the other one just, you know, uh, fills all the little gaps and stuff for the heat. So, um, but you know, there's debate. So maybe somebody will say, no, you're doing it wrong. I'm doing it this way. Uh, but there is a lot of debates online. Some say you need it, some say you don't. Uh, but you know, I wouldn't rely on just that. So I add the paste. Uh, and you don't want to put too much paste either, you know, because it defies the purpose. But these things are very important to isolate. And, and what happened, this amp, I had three fuses that were blown. Now, I, yes, I restored, I changed all the capacitors. It could have been done uh, due to one of the capacitors shorting out and everything. But uh, most likely, it looked like these. Uh, what happens is um, they dry out and it causes a, you know, a short and the fuse will blow. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's why there was three blown fuses. Uh, now there's also the screws when they're screwed down, there's also a little plastic cap that goes around them. Now if it's dried up, it's broken, it normally comes with a kit like that. There's a little plastic insert for the screw to make sure that the screw also doesn't touch, you know, and make a contact between uh, the transistor and the, um, the heat sink. Okay, so uh, if you're missing one or anything, or it's cracked or broken, normally comes with it. Make sure you change it. Make sure that, uh, you know, you put new, well, you don't necessarily need new ones of, for that. You need new ones of this. But like I said, if it's missing or cracked, please do change it. Um, so that's very, very important. And I'm pretty sure that's what had caused uh, the fuses to burn, uh, you know, to, to pop.
Hey, while I was editing this, I realized I forgot to tell you that um, there's a little piece of the Toshiba sign on the metal faceplate that came off. I know, I don't know what happened. It never happened to me before. You scrub those plates, they're metal, uh, but I'll be more careful next time. Uh, something that happened, my first mistake that, that uh, you know, I, I ever did like that. And uh, what can I say? It happens, so don't leave me a comment about it, I know. And, uh, you know, I'll be more careful next time. The boards are out of the dishwasher, so I continue replacing all the capacitors on the board. As usual, I chose Nishikon audio capacitors rated for higher voltage and temperature. Here's another example of the 220 microfarad capacitor I pulled off the board. It's testing at 278 microfarad with 46 ohms of resistance. Comparing this to the brand new one, you can see that the new one has a very low ESR of 0.21 ohms and testing within 8% of its value. And here's yet another example of a 10 microfarad I pulled that was testing at 14 with a resistance of 10 ohms. The new capacitors also take up less space, making for a much cleaner installation on the board. I then went over all the soldering joints because after 50 years many were not to my liking and some barely had any solder on them. I finished it off by cleaning the resoldered board with 99% alcohol and a soft toothbrush. I also cleaned the two potentiometers with some electrical contact cleaner. Since three of the four fuses on the board were burnt, I purchased new ones. I opted for ceramic fuses. The service manual calls for 1.6 amps as opposed to 1.5 that were installed, so I purchased the exact 1.6 volt fast acting ones, just because I'm a stickler for quality. In order to test the transistors properly, I had to remove them from the board. The first one tested okay. I then decided I was going to replace them all anyway, so I installed a new one. However, I quickly realized that the replacement I had been given was not suitable. So I had to take them all off one by one and test them to make sure I could keep the old ones. While I was doing this, I noticed the leg of one of the tiny transistors on the board was lifted, so I installed a jumper using a thicker 22 gauge wire as opposed to my usual 28 gauge, since this was a board with larger traces and more current. Here are the two power amplifier boards recapped, new fuses, and cleaned up. And let's not forget there were three other boards to recap. On the equalizer board, all the legs of the components were folded and twisted and soldered to the other components. So I had to desolder them and then heat the legs and straighten them before I could pull them out. And yes, I reinstalled them the same way. Some of the capacitors were too large and had been installed higher with heat shrink tubing around the legs. Because the new capacitors are so much smaller, it makes for a much cleaner installation with everything flush to the board. I of course resoldered all the joints, and after cleaning with 99% alcohol, here's the completed board. I then repeated the whole procedure for what the manual calls the sound quality board. I was forgetting there was also a tiny little board with only one fuse on it and a couple of wires connecting to it near the power supply. I resoldered it and cleaned it all up. Last but not least was the power supply. While the capacitors looked huge and easy to replace, the board had a bunch of wires attached to it and all around it that made it hard to remove. So I carefully soldered, pushing the wires out of the way, making sure I don't touch any of them with my soldering iron. Needless to say, the new capacitors were of higher voltage and heat tolerance while being a third of the size. I folded the legs to accommodate the larger holes on the board. When it came to the four-legged larger one, two of the legs were actually just for support. I only had a 35 volt on hand and I wasn't going to put out an order for this one capacitor, so I went to the local electronic shop. They had a brand name I had never heard of called Chenzing. Best I can tell is that they're from a company out in Taiwan, but I cannot confirm. 
However, the new capacitor was rated at 105 degrees and a slightly higher voltage tolerance. I tested it before putting it in and it tested perfectly within specification with an ESR of only 0.09 ohms. It held fine with two legs since it's a bit smaller, but I added some glue for stability. And because I'm a glutton for punishment, I had to disassemble the potentiometers in order to access them and they were of course connected to a board that had a few more capacitors and I figured might be a good idea to change those as well. So I cleaned all the potentiometers and replaced all the capacitors I had access to. Before reassembly, it was important to remove the old transistor micas from the heatsink and the dried up thermal paste with 99% alcohol. Once cleaned, I installed the new silicone insulators with new thermal paste. And it's about time I start thinking about putting this thing back together. Okay, so just a quick one on the capacitors. Um, I'm not talking about the capacitors themselves, but uh, a four-legged capacitor, because last time I talked about it uh, was on episode two, which was a long time ago, or episode 29. Now, you pull out a capacitor, it's got four legs, what do you do? Uh, so first of all, you got to read on the side, and I know you can't read from there, I'm just showing it, uh, I'll give you a close-up. Um, the thing is, is that there's there's values on the side. Now, this one only says 2200 microfarads, uh, 50 volts. The other uh, legs, it says there's a drawing, it says there's nothing on them. So basically the other two legs were just being uh, used for support and that was it. Okay, so you can easily replace it with a capacitor like this, which is just two legs, because as you see here, they'll tell you that the negative is on pin one and there's a uh, pin uh, three has 2200 microfarads with 50 volts. So um, please, 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 do not go on eBay and buy these for a lot hundred and eleven dollars shipping plus I don't know what else um, and oh it's new old stock it's original and everything you know the 70s and 80s as much as we think are yesterday it's 50 years ago now these things have a shelf life or manufacturer white papers even if it's never been used you cannot take a 50 year old capacitor and rely on it it dries up it's gonna blow up so uh, you know if you're gonna change that Please use the right thing. Now, if you do need something with um, a couple of values, there's a company in the United States. I don't remember the name right now, and I'm not affiliated with them, but I will get it for you that I found. Um, they do two or three values, whatever you need in the can size that you need and everything. And they had some pretty decent prices. Uh, but right now, we're talking about a regular capacitor, okay? And it could be replaced by this, which is $3.00. Please don't go and pay 111 and more uh, for something that's 50 years old. So $3, and these, by the way, are a lot better than these. Uh, you can get audio capacitors top of the line for about $4 Canadian, and as I always say, and literally $2 this time US. So, um, you know, you're going to get yourself some good Nishikan capacitors, audio capacitors for the same thing for, you know, like I said, three, four bucks. Uh, and to replace this so please don't go do not go and buy these old old capacitors uh, but do be weary when you check check that there's only one or two values and uh, you can fold the legs uh, because the holes are the holes are a little bit bigger fold the legs so it's going to hold and then um, for the two extra holes just add some solder block off the holes and that's it now because it's long these this is big so the two legs were, were supporting it this one because it's a bit longer all I did is add a bit, bit of glue for stability but you don't even need it it'll hold fine with the legs so that's all I have to tell you
So while I don't remember much on my age, I did have the number correct. It was 68, 68 capacitors that I changed in there. What a big job. Now I'd like to say complicated in the sense that it wasn't complicated to fix, but it was certainly complicated because of so many things to take apart uh, and do so many procedures. And I do, I do make it look easy sometimes on camera, but there's a lot that I do in between. Um, and I did also uh, adjust it after that as per the manual. Um, there's a little adjustment and stuff. I don't always show that because I don't want to bore you forever of me testing and, and doing things. But anyways, 
uh, it's all done. It sounds beautiful. I We will listen to it in a second. I just want to tell you, of course, that I'm recording into the camera a microphone. I'm putting it in the computer. I'm processing it, you know, for YouTube, compressing it. Uh, so you'll never hear uh, the true sound of it. You know, you'll never hear how amazing it sounds. But uh, also, I wanted to tell you, uh, this is a 4.0. It's a real quadraphonic amp, as I said. So if you take your home theater, for example, you get a 7.1. Now, if you play a mono track, or a stereo track you're only going to get it from the two speakers in front right so uh, you need a 7.1 recording to uh, hear your 7.1 sound now there were recordings made in the time that were 4.0 uh, on records and on tapes I don't have any of those recordings and honestly uh, even if I were to film my home theater in 7.1 or 9.1 uh, you're never going to hear it on YouTube and the thing is the same thing here so what I did is I recorded the front channel then I recorded uh, the the rear channel and uh, of course you know uh, I played with the volumes up and down so you could see because there's a volume for the left volume for the right I, I showed you that everything is working and it does sound really amazing so without further ado let's go listen to this 1973 beautiful vintage amp I love the smell of new capacitors in the morning let's begin by testing the front channel it turns on and the radio still works but I don't have an antenna and can't play anything on YouTube anyways so I'll just stream from my phone Thank you. 